Katharina, thank you for, for the studio visit. Where are you right now? I'm in Germany, in Berlin, and it is about 8.20 p.m. And I'm in my studio building. So I have a couple of different places in the city where I live and where I work. And I'm now in my um, first studio building where I used to live. I don't do that anymore. And I'm sitting at my writing desk. How does it, how does, how, how are you faring with the Corona crisis, Katharina? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of spaces, so I can actually make my work really well. It, it is really good for me. It took a lot of that um, stress off. I don't travel. Um, I just came from the United States before they locked down Germany and I had done a, uh, installed a show in Baltimore in the Museum of Fine Arts, so that had to be shut as well. So all the um, schedules are changing. Everybody in my office is in home office. Um, so I've been alone <laughs> in the studios, but um, I'm still working on the um, Hamburger Bahnhof show and that keeps me so busy and so concentrated that I, um, I live in that studio bubble, really. So you are not pausing, you're not paralyzed, you are basically using the time. Are you using the site for a reset, to reset, to reconsider how you yeah, work with artists and absolutely. projects? Yeah, so the first nine days of the lockdown, when we could prepare for it, I was very, um, uh, yeah, I was thinking of all the different scenarios. I was thinking of my, my private life, which is between New Zealand and Germany. I was thinking of... Um, business decisions. I had to reorganize my team. I had to think what to do with the pending shows. But after that, um, and I also traveled back from New Zealand in end of January. So I didn't feel so well after that trip. And I thought, oh, maybe I've caught it, you know. So I stayed home for a little, for like five or six days, which I never, ever do. So it was very special. And I started to read a lot. And um, reconcentrate and I think it is great to do exactly in these day, times of such a significant crisis, such a global crisis where we all share somehow the anxieties or maybe also the excitement of it that I, I think it is really good to have um, time to make work as a, as a processing mode you know and also as something that takes it up and um, uh, considered it while I do the work. So I very often think about things like that when I do my work. I don't only just, um, you know, paint something that I had in my mind, but it all is intertwined. And I, I like um, that um, possibility that I have right now. I'm very grateful for it, that I can do the work. Are you recording, photographing, taping, or making a diary or journal? Is there anything how you try to record the time, or is the recorded time going into your work? Is it work? Time? Yeah, it is more the work. I, um, I try to write things down, but I'm not a big journal person. I sometimes have the best intentions, and I write two sentences, and then <laughs> I go off it again. But um, I certainly have started to... Um, there is so much that is stripped off our lives and that is so remarkable. So all the entertainment industry in a way, you know, the sports industry, nothing is on the news anymore. There is no soccer results on um, Saturdays. There is no trophies being given, which there would be now. There is no preparation for other events. There is no socializing at all, which is changing the life so significantly that um, for me, also less traffic in the city, um, it has been very good. It has been a very good um, um, moment to look also at my own habits. I have started to see myself with my habitual um, energy so much clearer that I started to also be very self-critical at the moment. You know, I started to see my, my, the way that I do things, that I, the way that I think about people uh, in a, such a, like in a magnified um, version. And that was in, incredibly interesting. So that also changed the way I, I work and um, I, I think about my life. I think about what I want to do next. So that was very good, very healthy. Oh, great. That sounds great that you're making this time productive. That's really incredible to hear. Let's perhaps go into the slide projection. And I think this is so... When you, when you look at an artist's career, there's always perhaps a first work that in retrospect the artist 
either accepts as a first work or signifies a decision that, what does this work mean for you? It's from 1973. If you, if yeah. you, what, what, does, what does it mean to you? Oh, I, I was very surprised that my mother kept the egg. You know, it is so unusual that you would keep an, an Easter egg. And she said, it is so funny that um, she thought it was so much about what I do now. So that there is an infinite um, painting surface, that the painting has not one um, right point of view from where you can see it, that you have to turn it in your hand with your body to actually see the whole thing, you know. Um, also that the painting changes the egg into another functional um, object. And so she thought there were many things that actually are pointing at what, what I'm doing right now, my spatial um, development of that a painting can sit anywhere. It doesn't need like a certain uh, conventional uh, canvas as a shape, for example. And we've been joking a lot about these early drawings. You know, there is this fantastic Dürer drawing um, he did with, um, with ink uh, and he's 12, where he paints uh, like a smiling little boy and so here I'm also about 12 years old. Maybe I was a little younger, I don't know. So this when did is your uh, mother give that? When did your mother give that to you? Um, 20 years ago. Oh, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next picture because in that picture you are, you are around 20, untitled. I was told it's a tent. It is a tent, yeah. Can't you, <laughs> can't you see it? No, it is my, I think my first painting or my second painting and I was um, about to um, prepare for my final exams um, at the college and my mother said I should maybe go on an excursion to paint outside because she thought maybe that would be interesting for me. And up to that moment, I had never painted or thought about it. I thought I was gonna study psychology or something like that, but I wasn't sure what to do. And when I went um, there and I slept in a little tent because I was um, not, I was very late and there was no space for me that I could um, stay those 10 days and join the group. And um, I think I painted every day a new pa another painting, like a very different painting. And this was the tent painting. And that's where I thought that is really fascinating. You can paint something and only show a tip of it and the other maybe is not there. The existence of the tent might not be as clear as we think it is, but then you make something very clear about it. And I saw so much possibilities in thinking and freedom and accessing reality that I, um, I started to make work so that I could apply uh, for the art school. So that was basically a work that around the time you made this decision or that brought you to this decision? Yeah, I was about 19 years old and I decided I would go and, because up to then I was not really thinking I would do things with my hands. I was very much into language learning and traveling and you know, all that kind mm. of stuff. Music was very, was a big part of my life, but um, I never thought I would actually make work with mm. my hands. Let's go to the next slide, which is five years later, which feels frighteningly like already a Katharina Grosse in a funny way. It's a yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, I studied a very long time, so that is also very special about my generation. So in Germany, you would spend a long time at the art schools. And at that time, I was interested in a spatial concept that comes from the proto-Renaissance. So where you have these golden backgrounds and uh, people sitting on them or being shifted within that space. So the spiritual space was the golden background and like Simona Martini, for example, was a very uh, important painter for me or Conrad Witz, who is um, in Basel in the Kunstmuseum. So I went to see all the museums in Europe. That's what I did first of all when I was 20. So I tried to see every big collection that I could get um, access of and and that space that is um, like um, a, spir a spiritual space and not um, 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 a materialistic space. That was very important to me. Yeah. You studied with Gotthard Graupner, who is, I think, a very underestimated artist uh, internationally, but quite influential in Europe. And of course, you were in the Kunstakademie in Düsseldorf. There was Gerhard Richter. There was... Uh, 
um, Joseph Boyce, other artists of your stature and uh, were there just perhaps a couple of years older. Let's go to the next slide because I think this is such an incredible work here. You were 27, 28 years old. Yeah, I think no, I was younger. I was, um, I think that was my first trip alone to Italy. Yeah. And I went to Sardinia and then to Florence. And um, yeah, there was this incredible landscape and I made this um, painting out outside um, with a very small paintbrush. It was a spontaneous thought uh, with friends together. And um, yeah, so maybe there is something that also resonated with me early on that a painting could be somewhere. It doesn't have to be on a piece of, of paper. Or... Yeah. How big is that? How big is that landscape painting? Is that just strategically photographed that it looks gigantic or was it quite big? Oh, it was quite big. We had to go to another village to buy more uh, colors and paint and it developed over the course of the summer and it was quite big. It, it doesn't look so, I think it looks actually smaller than it was. Mm -hmm. And um, it was on a cliff that was kind of warped. So yeah. it looks, it doesn't really look, it looks a little flat. Um, I remember well paint shopping with you, Katarina, and I remember well <laughs> selecting the exact paint, so I know how this goes. Let's go to the next, the next slide. Um, yeah, that is a painting that I did at the end of my um, student times, and it was in terms of its method really interesting, I thought. It, was, uh, it started out with very clean colors, like reds, yellows, blues, unmixed and I gave them each like um, a certain place very thickly painted on like just I would say um, touches bum 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 like in a row and then I took one off and took one down from the other part of the canvas and I exchanged them so very it changed sorry it's very monumental it's six by seven feet that's quite a monumental painting if if you think that's kind of, you're not a student anymore for such an abstract painting. Do you still have that painting? Uh, no, that was um, uh, Borda, Frieda Borda bought it for his collection. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I'm always made large works. I never made, I made a smaller things as well, but um, that was a normal size. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next, because this I think is a very important moment. This is a Kunsthalle in Bern late 90s and if we go to the next just to see a detail of this and we go back one just to see this so here because we saw you paint on unusual ob objects an egg the coast in sardinia we see you deal with architecture and architectural scale and you and i had a lot of discussions that you are actually using architecture as a canvas to paint on but it still stays a painting and it doesn't become a painted wall or a painted room, which would be different. This piece seems to be such an important piece in your career. Say a bit about how you got to this piece and what it meant for you. Yeah, it is the first time that I kind of realized that where I look, where I go with my eye, the painting has to be. So that the touching the, with the eye of the um, sculptural surface, if it is architecture or another object. So I can go with my eye and travel really far. I can go to the next house or to, um, you know, to a lamppost. Um, so I thought a painting has to behave like the eye behaves um, in, the, in the space. It should not be um, on a designated surface that is then supposed to be um, a canvas that then sits on the wall. So I thought the canvas was too much like the imitation of the wall. I thought the painting itself is a much more fluid, a more um, independent matter than the canvas. Mm -hmm. So I kind of stripped it off the canvas and made it like a film, like a, a mobile entity and that is the first time that actually I experimented with shifting it out of the parameters of the um, Euclidean space in a sense because I made wall paintings before that but they mm. were always done with a paintbrush so I was stopped by the ceiling or by the um, corner in a sense because the paintbrush would go towards it and the contact with the wall was 
giving me um, moving space and starting to use the spray gun, all of a sudden I was independent from the material um, uh, conditions of the exhibition space. The painting is where the eye goes. I remember we had this discussion, the painting is where the eye goes. So you needed kind of a body extension to make the paint go where the eye goes. And that is when you started with the spray gun because you project your view, but you also project the paint. That's how did true. it come about? Yeah. Share, could you share this with us? How your projecting projectile painting came about? Um, it's a lot of different thoughts coming together. Uh, I think one was that I discovered, I, I lived in France in Marseille and I was a part of a little artist group there that were all using spray guns and they kind of made me use one and I didn't like it much, but I remember very, very specifically how the sprayed um, paint is sitting on the surface because the spray gun makes out of paint little bubbles and there are actually little sculptural things that sit on the surface. And I was very amazed at that very small but very poetic detail. And then the other thing is that um, when you work with the spray gun, you can kind of um, enter a painting from the middle with a clean color and spray that clean color in an existing color. So or in this case, I could um, make the color um, um, thin and transparent in a way that I would never be able to with a paintbrush because the paintbrush always touches the surface and the existing painted space. It's such and an interesting is, yeah. way of thinking about it that you can touch without a trace. So you project and you don't touch the surrounding or you don't have to kind of move around the surrounding. So this is a very important piece to my mind, Das Bett, the bed from 2004. And I want to show now that everybody saw the, the total, I want to zoom into a detail, which I think is incredible. Yeah, I decided to, I had two places where I lived. Um, I lived in Düsseldorf and in Berlin and I left the bed that way and I decided to paint it over and the next time I would come back home. And that was the first time that I painted on things on, as you just showed, like books, music, um, clothes. Um, and uh, that was amazing. So that was really the first time that I got out of that so-called abstract uh, um, language into placing the painting within the um, living space. The painting is where the eye goes, but the eye goes and doesn't really touch physically, but the spray gun does. And I remember working with you, the discussions if spraying something is actually an act of violence. What is, there, is this a purely constructive, is this purely constructive or is there anything in you that processes a way that of course you can't use the bed anymore, you can't use the books anymore, you can't use the house in the Rockaways anymore. Is this a purely constructive or is there a certain aggression in it? Yeah, possibly. I mean, aggression in the sense of getting very close to something, I think there is, but not aggression in the sense that you kind of, um, it's not, labeled as aggression against something specifically. I think it is um, transformative purely. So it, it is still there. So the bed is still there and the books are still there. So what I basically do is I try to propose a way to transform something without discarding it, without erasing it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to use the conditions and accept them as they are and yet make a proposal for a new way of looking at it. Yeah, a new way of looking for it for me was very important in this project. So Hurricane Katrina happened and for me Hurricane Katrina was very important as a viewer. I had never been to New Orleans and you see the helplessness and it felt so uncoordinated and it felt like there is an inside and an outside, but nobody from the outside knows how to help in the inside and the inside is not coordinated. So for me, the New Orleans Biennial Prospect was an inspiration to do something after Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy in New York, because watching TV in 2000, uh, when, when Hurricane Katrina happened, 
for me, it was very, very clear. There was 2006, right? It was clear that if I'm in an area like this, I think art has to be responsive, responsive, not responsible, but activist perhaps. So two years after Hurricane Katrina, there was this project and perhaps we also look at the next slide, just a detail here. And I came across your work and of course I knew your work before, but I felt you had given somehow this was finding form on a different level. This possibly dedicating objects to art that you did, you're spraying over, or you architecturally enlarging the concept of art. All of a sudden, this had also a signal where the eye goes is where the attention goes. So if we went back to the building, because this was just one of these streets in the Ninth Ward, could you say a little bit how you got to this project, which I think was really a groundbreaking revelation for me just as a curator. So I really, you, you remember how I started talking about this project. What did this really mean for you? And, and how do you feel about this project today? Yeah, I think um, a lot of the things that you mentioned were true for me as well. That was the first time I went to New Orleans. Um, I had a great experience there. I listened to amazing music, um, the vibe um, of these little places where people played music was for me something I had never seen before. But what was fascinating was that the people that drove me around the city didn't want to go to the Lower Ninth Ward. They didn't want to show it to me. So after two days of traveling around, they hadn't managed to go there with me. And, um, and then there were places they wanted me to see, but they were afraid I would mess them up after they had you know, made them pristine. So there was a very strange psychological vibe. And when I went to the Law Ninth Ward, I thought, wow, that's the place where you have to be because it is so dangerous. I mean, you see the steel wall up there with the Mississippi water behind it. And you just go, man, how can you live here? It's just incredible. And I, that is where I realized that I need to have, when I choose a place, it has to be a place that's already in transformation, that is already on a hinge, on a swivel, where it could go this way or that way. So either a place for crisis or a place where you have the chance to renegotiate um, different parties' um, interests. And I that was starting there. I had the same experience. I visited Prospect, not at the opening, but later, and somehow nobody wanted to show me this project or somebody, <laughs> and I insisted on seeing it. And what I perceived was that you all of a sudden made this so, so lovable, so, so precious, so beautiful. You gave something that was discarded, like the whole area was like ready to be um, torn down. All of a sudden you gave this an, a, a very un, un, unexpected beauty and it had a dignity to it that I was surprised because this was just not spraying some paint over a building. It became a third. It wasn't just a painting, it wasn't just a decrepit building, but it became something in itself that I felt was about dignity and pride and beauty. And it's kind of when you say that a work is autonomous, I, I felt this autonomy, which I felt was very, it wasn't sometimes you do something in ruins and you think you, it's actually, you're exploiting the ruins. You didn't exploit it, you added something to, to them, which I felt was very important. If we go to the next slide, because this is such a different approach now. So a couple of years later, and perhaps we go for the second. This is a huge show you did in Dusseldorf. So here we have the, the ground that you're using, the architectural setting that you're using. And here it looks as if the canvas is taking off the stretcher and, but it's also not adhering to the wall anymore. Here, the canvas or something becomes architecture. What was, what was the, the strategy that brought you to a work like this, Katarina? Yeah, I wanted to kind of uh, completely um, disguise um, or take the rigidity of the space away and expose at the same time some features of it really, really harshly in a sense. So the, um, the skylights and the, the columns are as well part of the show as 
the soil and the fabric is. And uh, I wanted kind of to have the structure of the, the, the space perforate the, the painting as well as the painting wraps in, you know. So I wanted this kind of equality between the two um, um, elements. And another thing that was very important to me was the impermanence of the work that started to come about with the New Orleans piece because it didn't hold up for so long. The grass was growing, of course, uh, the rain was coming and so on. And um, so you, uh, this is the show at the end of, that's at the end of the show. So people were walking through it and were rubbing the paint off with their feet and the dust was everywhere. So it looked almost as if the painting was either coming back up or going somewhere else. And I thought both um, um, ways of looking at the work are really, really great. I think this is such an interesting move when you say the painting is for you the painter, the painting is where the eye goes, but then you allow the viewer to go onto the painting and to be really on top of it or part of it or walk here across. Let's have a look at the four slides that are following because I think this is, this is also, of course, you can be a passerby, you can be on a train and watch a painting. And then of course the movement of the train, let's go to the next one, reveals the, um, the sequencing of the painting and the coloring of the painting. Let's keep it here. Perhaps we go one slide back because the green of course imitates life in a way that you think, oh, that might be just a green yard next to the train tracks. But let's look at this. I know how precise you are with colors and how precise, for example, you, when I remember we did the Rockaways, you said, I want the red because it's the biggest contrast to the blue of the water. And that's also the reason lifeguards wear it because it's the most visible. So you are very conscious about choosing the colors. If you go one back, one slide back here, even a more drastic color that doesn't feel like you would encounter it in nature. Say a bit yeah, that was really like that. That was really that magenta. Yeah, that was the first project um, after New Orleans that was outdoors. And it was in a, in a really interesting location. It, is alongside, it was alongside the Amtrak um, um, corridor of five miles going out of Philadelphia. And um, we had like um, identified eight places that were very um, symbolic in a sense. So we had like these shrubs and rubble, then we had um, a wall, we had a warehouse, we had a little hut and we had a bridge. And um, there were huge um, areas that we had to paint. Actually, I had a big team and um, I needed to have only one color there or maybe two co one color. So it was only orange, magenta and green that was underpainted with white so that the vibrance of the color would still be um, good and visible. And what I really liked is what you would drive by, you know, pass by and it was like maybe 10 seconds and then it was gone. And that kind of lifespan of looking at it, um, you can relate to your own lifespan, to your impermanence in a sense. You know, I thought that it was a really great, I, it gave me an acceleration to, uh, in a way that I would not have when people pass by works, when they uh, are on accelerators or when they are on bridges or on staircases sometimes, you know, people pass by my works. But here it was such another level. And very cinematic in its velocity. The velocity is cinematic. But then of course, all painting, I wonder when I first saw Barnett Newman, I felt time revealing itself to me just walking by the length of it. But here, of course, it's, it's a revelation that happens on, on train speed. Paint, a painting is where the eye goes and visiting your studio, I know them layers and layers and layers of surfaces. There's a wall, there is something leaned against the wall, a canvas is in the very front. And when you use landscape or a building as your studio, of course, you have to deal with the surfaces that are there. There are leaves, there are soil, there are rocks. I would like to go to the first gallery. We have two, vis two pictures of a gallery view here. This is Johann König, and Johann is 
actually um, such a pioneer in creating a gallery space out of this raw concrete from a church. And it's such an unlikely space because it's not the white cube. It has wooden ceiling and mm. very strong, the architecture is, and it's more like, it feels like a site specific work of art itself. And then you have these really raw, rough concrete walls. But I felt to put this image and the next one in, you see even a little bit more about the spatial, these works of yours are monumental. And I remember seeing that exhibition, how monumental these pieces are. They must be like 20 foot by 10 foot. They're huge. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was important to show this because I think the architectural scale, that's also the reason I wanted to talk about the scale early on. I think the architectural scale mirrors your interest in architecture and mirrors um, your interest in collapsing the painting and the architecture by connecting it in a certain way. Yeah, it's also that I like the, um, the way we look at work. I think we, we don't really look at work like so focused. I think we are very, the peripheral um, vision is very important. It's, it's very often that I come home and I've just seen something out of the corner of my eye and I know, oh, I have to check that out again, you know? So this kind of, picking up things in a very casual way while passing something by. I really find that fascinating. And then I think that the body relationship to the painting is um, very important. That our body intelligence is so triggered by something that is visceral and that is um, tactile. And it is a different um, image information we get from a painted image than we get from an image on the screen. And not that I don't think screen images are good. It's just that my um, area, my my area of interest is in that other um, surface. Mm. Let's go to the next, because that's, of course, where we are intimately connected. That is true. So I say a bit about the setting. The setting is an old, it, an old military fortress, Fort Tilden. So it was built as a fortification on the Atlantic Ocean. Then, of course, Fortunately, with peace and, and no military fortresses needed there, it slowly, fortunately, became a national park. It's a beautiful national park. Jamaica Bay, Rockaway Beach Conservancy is taking care of this. And there were these buildings. There were buildings that were used by the military before. And there's an old airplane hangar. And there were these buildings that were right on the coastline. And of course, over decades, they fell apart. So. These, if we go to the next slide, you see they're like right on the waterfront. They're right on the waterfront. And what was so surprising to me is that I thought like a hurricane destroys architecture and civilization. We had all the floods in lower Manhattan and Rockaways everywhere. What I was most surprised by is that of course, a hurricane takes also aim at nature. So in front of this beautiful building, now beautiful building, there was a huge sand dune all washed away. There was like a little like forest-like sand dune nearly. And the beach was gone for like 200 yards in its depth. It was all gone. So this is a point where I called you and I said, what can we do actually with a building like this? Let's go for the next slide. And for the next. Do you want to say a bit about this project, Katarina? Yeah, what I found really fascinating that this is the first time that I had, um, or that you found a place where I could do, I could right away hook into that point of transformation. So the, the building was already about to be transformed by the sand and the glasses and the windows were gone. It was only the skeleton of a building and which made it such an archaic, image as well. So I also see the, the sites that I'm invited to work on are images themselves already and I just implement my work into that again. So I think it is more like an overlayering of different perspectives in a certain way and it's at the border, at a border in a sense also because there is the sea and there is the beach. So from each perspective that is a different idea you might get. So coming from the sea you might be 
on a flight and going into the sea, you might be on a holiday, you know. So conflicting interests are coming together at this um, moment in time and location. And I think that is exactly a really great way to put a painting and insert it and highlight um, somehow the, the, pot the potential of emotional impact that, that a location might have. Yeah. Just, just for information, we taped off a 200 yard radius, so yeah. 200 meter radius around the painting area. We wrapped the trees and the vegetation and the sand dunes and we took biodegradable biodegra uh, paint. So there was like, because it's in a national, par a national park, you wanna be extra, extra careful. So it was all taped off. We had this biodegradable um, paint. And there was an already picturesque ruin and it would have been a possibility there is a ruin that had graffiti on and you could have painted the building and at some point in the process you had painted it nearly solid red magenta and it looked like a painted house and you and I had a conversation where I said Katarina there's three things there is the existing found object the ruin and there could be the goal to have a painted house. We paint it, or there could be the goal to have a third, to have a painting that is autonomous, a painting that is just using that decrepit house as a canvas, but it has a beauty and a meaning and a strength and a presence in itself. And that was one of the most productive discussions I felt having with an artist because it was such a privilege to be part of this, this production. Say a bit about your thinking about having this, this found object and, and the layers that you put on top of it, because I thought that was an incredibly um, courageous process, how you worked on this piece. Yeah, that is maybe something a little strange for um, nowadays art practice. I really paint that painting on site. So I, I mean, I made models and Klaus, you remember you came to the studio, I think even with a group of people from the museum and we talked about the models and how we could paint maybe even more. You see that little house in the background and that could maybe also be part of it. And then um, during the process, we developed where I could work and the, the painting process itself is then a totally different issue on site. So I think I painted this whole thing over twice a day and we had to go uh, on night, um, uh, we had to have a crew that went on night up to New Jersey to get new colors and uh, it was um, really interesting for over seven days, I think. Uh, we painted it over every day, every day, every day until the ba balance between the white and the two reds that we used was um, good. And I agree, I think that was a really great and to me a very memorable discussion we had because we didn't talk about what looks better. We talked about what is going to be the impact of the work. And um, yeah, that is certainly something that I took into the next projects. And here you can also see how it does change when there are people. So that is also something really weird, you, you paint it, alone and there is nobody on it but your crew. But then when the show is open, you have thousands of people walk on it and change it by their presence and by their clothes and their way they behave in it. I felt it was incredible to have Bloomberg, the Jamaica Bay Conservancy, to have the national parks. National Park started a discussion about Walker Evans when I first introduced you, which was so interesting. It was one of the examples where you feel like for ecology or for raising awareness, that you can actually create a synergy between so many different institutions, which was incredible. And to just make the most, um, the most radical cut from something so site specific and so temporary, I wanna go to the next image because I think that's so important to see together. Um, having your gallery work for me is very, in, is very much informing how I look at your site-specific works. And I look at your gallery exhibitions very much informed by your site -specific. So it's, it's a, it's, it's, it goes both ways. Say a bit about this exhibition, please, Katarina. Yeah, that's the, um, my first show with Gagosian in 24th Street in New York. And I had the whole gallery, which was super and really great. I had really great talks also with 
uh, Louis Neri and Jona Lüdekens who um, invited me in and uh, we prepared uh, the show really carefully and what is really different as you can also see that um, the canvases and they are quite big here in this in this large um, uh, space of the gallery they are very very multi-layered and so the in in the rockaways piece it's almost as if you take something apart as if it goes into slow motion and expands the painting could actually be just a bit of something much larger that comes from somewhere else Whereas the paintings uh, in the gallery are, the canvas paintings are smaller containers that get a lot of different layers that um, where the action is crammed and crunched and where something that I'm very fascinated by in painting comes to its full potential, which is that you have clusters of activity. So you see mm -hmm. a lot of different layers at the same time. I want to go to the next slide because I think here canvas is in a different way uh, used, it's used as an architectural wall. You said before, you sometimes separate the canvas from the wall or you, you want to see it autonomous. Here you are actually nearly building walls with this. The horse trotted another couple of meters and it stopped in carriage works in Sydney. Say a bit about your approach here and I will, because we have several images of, so I will go through these images while you talk because I think it's yeah. so nice to see. Yeah, the Carriage Works is a theater in Sydney with like five or six black box theaters, fantastic institution. And they invite once a year people that are related to the theatrical in the broadest sense. And I actually also, I had a piece of a fabric sewn in the space that's 8,000 square meters and I crunched it together and folded it and knotted it into the ceiling so that the um, structure of the um, of the institution, the architectural structure and the work itself would um, keep each other up in a sense. So without the, um, the steel columns and the steel beams, I wouldn't be able to show the work. And then I had it knotted up there and painted it on this, uh, in this uh, site. And here you see it after a couple of weeks, people walk through it, unfold it, it becomes a little bit used like uh, unruly in a sense and um is that site specific when i think about the rockaway project i remember people tried taking bricks off the building and the, the building was meant to be because rising sea levels it was on on the coastline it was a health risk because it could fall apart so it was taken at some point it was taken down but I remember people taking bricks and they had like their Katharina Grosse brick. I still see them in oh houses. Um, what do you do? Do you dispose of the canvas here? These 8,000 square meters of cloth, are they gone? Are they disposed or what are you doing with this? Yeah, in this case, we, um, we um, kept them. So we cut them apart in like three tracks each. So. There are big um, rolls of fabric put into beautiful boxes and I have the whole thing in a box and I could actually reinstall it. There is a very intricate um, sewing plan and a knotting plan and you can, well, we tried with the K11 show, we tried to reinstall it and we did do that. So K11 had also a big folded um, painting and we installed it in Guangzhou after Shanghai. I remember you and I thinking about scarves, but that's more blankets and coats. <laughs> yeah, that is, yeah. No, this is another, that was really big, that installation. It was fun. And I did that at the same time as I painted this. And that was for me super fascinating, you know. So I had the folded, crunched, very um, organic form. And then I painted these very large pieces of um, fabric for the um, National Gallery in Prague which is huge. It's like um, 300 feet long and um, 100 feet high. And um, on each of those walls, they would go up. And I rented the studio in Berlin to paint those large paintings. And this is the first time that I started to use also the residue that comes about while painting. So these yeah. two paintings show all my errors, my decision making. I would not um, kind of try to, you know, um, make invisible what I didn't like. So everything that I needed to make the work, whether I liked it or not, is in this work. 
Yeah, I, I, I very much like the transition between this and if we go one back, because I thought about putting the slide projections together if we needed an explicit studio picture. But then, of course, this is kind of as good as it gets to see. Yeah, that's my studio. That's also how my studios look like. I have another studio that's exactly like that. Yeah, so let's go back to, the, to Prague. The incredible scale. I talked before and, of course, talking to you saying, oh, that's big, that's seven by six feet. Uh, of course, that's dwarfed by these. These are like uh, 45 feet tall paintings. And they are, as you say, they're like, they're like 120 feet long, which is incredible. Yeah, it's, I think there has to be a certain um, absurdity about um, your relationship to scale because otherwise the uh, psychological impact doesn't get really clear. So um, there should be, um, this certainly was um, an attempt to get to a situation where scale doesn't matter anymore. Where it's so um, difficult, it is very, it was difficult to grasp. You don't really see that in the, in the photographs. The photographs show you something else. They show you the schematic um, structure of the work, but you can't really see how you saw and experienced it. And you could see it from different levels in the museum as well. It was quite impressive. It was a great, um, very difficult location, but very interesting. Are colleagues of yours saying that you are exploding the format of painting? Uh, um, I don't know what that would mean. Uh, uh, I, I try to imagine any kind of uh, any form possible for a painted image in our life, you know. I'm trying to find out where it could sit, where it could appear, how it could impact in our daily lives, how it could um, show us alternatives to our sometimes lame thinking. So that's what I do. Uh, I also make very small things. I, I, I'm, it's like swimming in the sea, in the ocean or in a river. It's all different ways to do it. And um, yeah. What was the reception in Prague? Or oh, they thought it was um, amazing, I guess. Um, but I mean, it is a fascinating city, Prague also. Prague is such a... Um, I, I installed at a time of the year in February where this light is silver, beautiful sky, but something dark in it. And it's so historic. It has from all um, centuries, um, to now um, architectural monuments of utter beauty. And uh, this um, museum is an old, um, was one of the first big shopping malls in Europe. Um, it was turned into a museum and it's a little bit off the center. And uh, a lot of young people were there, very interesting people. Very, very, uh, very interesting people made the catalog as well, super fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting how Prague became politically so conservative in yeah. a way, over the last yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, just that, yeah, I mean, the people I worked with, Adam Budak, GSG5, they're not in the museum anymore because the people thought, they, they, I think there were only two shows in that hall. That was um, Ai Weiwei and I. You're talking about how, how the reception was in a country <laughs> that is not exactly known to be very liberal and open-minded. and. I do think that you are pushing the envelope here very, very drastically and in, in such a constructive way here, like defining painting as a, as a very different spatial experience here. So let's go further to the next slides because this is, and the next one, we, because we're entering Shanghai. This was such a beautiful, we, the opening of your exhibition in Shanghai, we made also to a mocha party, remember? It was, it was wonderful, amazing. Yeah. Wonderful remember. party in Shanghai. And if we go to this as an experience, because I think, and the next, you see the scale, and the next, you see the, the viewers in this work here, being a little bit like lost, but also blending in, we go to the next. And you we have to, we actually made like five different zones through which we, you could navigate and um, 
see different um, a different status of how painting could behave in a sense. And as you all know, this um, mall, the K11, is in the, gr the ground zero of the shopping mall. It's a huge space, but it's very low. So it is just the opposite of what we've just seen, just high space and long and defined. This was more like um, an itinerary that I wanted to create through which you would walk. And uh, it had the same blueprint as all the other um, uh, floors of the shopping mall. So it was actually part of a mall, a maze of goods and consumption. And so that was very fascinating to be in that context. I remember sitting on that furniture. You could I know, I, I even sent you a photo with you on it. I thought you would include it into the slideshow, but you didn't. No, <laughs> better not. <laughs> You're no, we had a great time. It is very important that there are people in there. But there are also things that I haven't done before, like for example, this styrofoam sculpture that I cut um, also in Shanghai. It consists of like um, five or six different things that are um, in the end put together. It was a like um, 60 feet long um, amorphous um, element that we call the ghost. And it is kind of moving into prints of my studios, which are printed on silk. So you see different um, parts of different um, areas in the studio, which um, also are used to kind of um, show something that's not there. Yeah, I but think... This picture for me was so important to put this last because I think it's revealing a photographic process, a painting process, a, pin, a printing process, the layering process. You have these tarps, the drop cloth on one side, you look mm -hmm. into another space in your studio, you have the layering of the different painted surfaces in your studio, you take the painting off, then you have like a stencil around the painting where the, where the spray paint like basically spilled over, sprayed over. And I would like to end our, our presentation through your work in the present time. And in the present time, you are working on a project here. It's a Hamburger Bahnhof. Hamburger Bahnhof, one of the amazing pieces at Hamburger Bahnhof is the work Tallo, Unschlitt by Joseph Beuys, which is the negative space uh, cast under uh, uh, a staircase underpass, and but it looks like icebergs. It looks like Caspar David Friedrich's Ice Mare. It looks like a Berklin Island, and of course, thinking about romantic German landscape painting, uh, the Ice Mare, the, the Ice Sea. This is of course something that comes to our mind in the same location that you're dealing with. It's in the same collection, but still it's something very, very different. It's something that we just saw in Shanghai. You called it this ghost element that you, in, that you started. Say a bit about what that actually is. What is the material? What is the material of these blocks, Katharina? Yeah, we are looking at um, different elements that are then put together. This is styrofoam and it had a, quite a, an interesting process. So I made like a small model and I used hot wires to cut the styrofoam. And then we had the small models scanned, 3D scanned, and then we had it carved by a five axis a carving machine into a larger scale. So we went from one to 10 to one to five. And now we have it here in one to 0 0.9. And then I would always re-carve it. <clears throat> so when I got, <clears throat> excuse me, when I got the, the carved um, version from the machine, I would then recarve it with a hot wire and change it drastically. So I would actually modify the model from scale to scale to scale to scale. And in a certain sense, this is also for me like another model. It's just very large. They do exist also often in a metal cast version, or are these only the smaller ones? Yeah, no, this is a small thing and that has a different um, function. Mm -hmm. if, if we go further, we see here the door of the Hamburger Bahnhof and we see the scale of the Grand Hall there. Um, the painting will not stay in the main space of Hamburger Bahnhof. The painting will basically go outside of it, right? So you have here the space behind it. What are you planning there and when do you think will it open, Katharina? 
Well, I'm hoping it will open uh, mid of June. And what we just saw, the styrofoam pieces, they will be painted over. So that is just an in-between shot of my installation process. And at the end of the Hamburger Bahnhof, you can swivel open these large glass doors. And what is going to be interesting is that I not only paint the whole indoors, but I also go, as you see it there, I go outdoors onto the cobblestones pavement, onto the um, outside of the, um, the recolon, which is the, where the collection is also presented. So it will turn from the inside into the outside from an indoor um, uh, sculptural element onto the outside of, of, a, um, uh, of a building. So you can also enter the, here, this is a very good shot. So you can also enter the museum from down there and go through the main entrance, to, through that entrance that normally is never opened. Hmm. So there is a certain correlation between in and out and inside, outside um, turn. And it's uh, quite a large painting. So I think I have never done anything as, as large and expanding as this time. So you have um, the sculptural elements in the Grand Hall of the Hamburger Bahnhof, then you open the big back door and go to the outside and go onto the surface of the architecture. Will you, in the, um, in the indoors of Hamburger Bahnhof, will you, it's a kind of a rhetorical question, if I kind of <laughs> envision myself saying the question, I know the answer. You will not stay on your sculptures. You will basically... How will you deal with the, with the floors? How do you deal with the interior architecture of the space? Yeah, I will go on the floor, um, but I won't go on the walls. So it will be on the floor, move outside, um, go across the sculptures, go further down uh, on the pavement, and then um, maybe a third of that area that we can see here on the right-hand side of the uh, recolor is going to be um, part of it. And, um, Amazing. We have a little video. You included a video. Videos are famous for being glitches in presentations. Let's see if it works. Just the spatial experience. I think experiencing sculpture is often so important to how you walk around it and have this resonance and you can compare your own bias with this. It is going to be fantastic um, to see that it's actually like a very local, as you said, it's so like um, connected to the tradition of the other collection um, because people won't travel as much. So it will really be um, a, a show for the city. For the How people. far away from the museum is your studio, Katharina? Oh, that's very close, maybe um, 10 minutes by bicycle or something. I love the fact you're going by bicycle. Oh, I'm not going by bicycle, but <laughs> that would be, it's very close. It's, cool. it's really beautiful. It's very impressive. The multi-dimensionality of the movement with the hot wire is very close to the way that you move through space. So it was very fascinating to make the work. I can't wait for this piece to be ready. When do you think will you open given the fact that the German museums are in the process of reopening. Some of them reopened last Monday and Tuesday. When do you think will you reopen? Um, mid of June, I think 14th of June. 14th of June, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Katharina. This was such an incredible journey into your work and thank you so much for being so thoughtful about it. Thank you, Katharina.